Uh, hi, my name is Noam Shazir. Um, I'm going to tell you about Mesh TensorFlow, which is a system we built uh, uh, for training giant models on TPU pods. So, so we're going to talk about uh, data parallelism and model parallelism, and uh, also about why I want to train giant models and why we need model parallelism to do it. Then, then I'll tell you about the Mesh TensorFlow system. So first, uh, data parallelism. This is how roughly everybody trains neural networks if you have uh, distributed hardware. This is what we use on TPU pods at Google. Um, and generally, you put your entire model on every device, split up a training batch into a lot of little chunks, one on each device, run it, then add up all the gradients on the parameters across all the devices and do your update. Um, this, this works really well. The communication is fast on, on, uh, on our kinds of networks, on lots of different types of networks, in fact. Um, so this is roughly what everyone's doing. Uh, the great things about it are it's universal. You can use any model architecture. Um, fast to compile because you're writing SPMD code. You're writing code for what one device is doing, and then uh, you can compile it and send it to every device uh, which is using the same code. And you get roughly full utilization because every device is doing roughly the same thing. So if uh, they're all similar, then uh, nobody's waiting for anybody else. And uh, the communication is fast. The, the only problem is that you cannot train giant models because your entire model has to fit on every device. So, why do I want to train giant models? Well, I, I like uh, working on language modeling. Uh, there are lots of Im important applications, machine translation, question answering, uh, dialogue, sentiment analysis, lots of interesting things to do with language. And we find that quality improves with model size. So a bigger model tends to know more about the world, uh, understand things better, and give you overall better results. There's plenty of data out there to train a giant model. Just download the text of the web, common crawl, whatever, and, uh, and you've, got, uh, you've got billions to trillions of words of training data. And in fact, you can train one big model and then fine tune it to do lots of different things. Uh, there's been a lot of research at OpenAI and Bird at Google on, um, on transfer le uh, learning and language. So it's a great candidate for building giant models. Now, uh, as an example, I uh, trained a transformer language model with the roughly 100 million parameters on the text of Wikipedia. The Abraham Lincoln article was in the dev set, uh, in the held out set, and I told it to generate a random Abraham Lincoln article. And it looks roughly grammatical, uh, remembers that somehow that he's a politician, uh, American politician. There's plenty it doesn't know about the world, like who Abraham Lincoln was, or that uh, America doesn't have a prime minister, and lots of other stuff. Um, but if you make the similar model just bigger, here's with 5 billion parameters instead of 100 million, and now it seems to have picked up a lot more about Abraham Lincoln. Roughly half of that stuff is correct, but you know, <laughs> mostly it's fake news. But there are more important uh, applications out there than, than generating fake news. Um, but, but this is just a nice demonstration that, that model size is important. Um, what would a model look like with a trillion parameters? Uh, we have not done that yet, but we hope to do, <laughs> to do that soon. Um, OK, so if all the parameters will not fit on one core, we need to do something called model parallelism, which means that we're splitting the model itself between different devices. And that should let us train really large models. And it should also be very good for inference latency, because now the computation for one example can be split across multiple devices. The problem is it's very tricky to design these kinds of algorithms. Um, how do people tend to do it now? Well, you use device placement. You say, this operation's going on this device. This operation's going on that device. TensorFlow makes it easy to do that. Still, it's tricky to design an efficient algorithm, and you end up with a giant graph if you're generating enough operations to go on 2,000 different cores. Um, here's an example of some uh, model parallelism by device placement from uh, Google Neural Machine Translation. They had eight 
LSTMs, which they distributed across eight different GPUs, the softmax layer they put somewhere else, and you need some kind of uh, interesting pipelining to keep all the GPUs busy. It works, but uh, you know, a lot of work to, to get this thing to work right. Now, we're going to take a totally different approach, which is going to be inspired by what works well about synchronous data parallelism. So we will have every processor involved in every operation. Uh, we're going to use SPMD-style programming, where you'll have the same program on every device. And it's going to use collective communication, like all reduce, um, just like uh, data parallelism. Um, and, the way, and our library for doing this is called Mesh TensorFlow. We should be able to implement data parallelism, model parallelism. We should be able to split in different dimensions, like uh, split a, an image or video spatially, or any sorts of combinations of these things. And we're uh, targeting hardware where you have a homogeneous set of similar processors, ideally um, well-connected, like a TPU pod. We've got these two-dimensional supercomputers uh, at Google that, we, that we've been using. Uh, and you're going to view your set of processors as an n-dimensional mesh. It doesn't have to correspond to a physical n-dimensional mesh. You could view a two-dimensional mesh of processors as a one-dimensional mesh. Um, but of course, performance will depend on, uh, on those considerations. So how does this all work? Well, in data parallelism, you can view it as splitting the batch dimension of the computation across all your processors. So any tensor that has a batch dimension is going to be split across all the processors. And any tensor that does not have a batch dimension, meaning the, uh, meaning the parameters, gets fully replicated. Now, we're going to do the same thing, but for model parallelism, we will choose different dimensions to split. So maybe dimensions representing the sizes of hidden layers, and we will decide to split those dimensions across the uh, set of processors. So, and the communication will happen, usually an operation will not involve communication, but some operations will involve collective communication like all reduce, particularly when you're reducing out split dimensions. And this is going to be somewhat similar to how, uh, how things work in synchronous data parallelism. Okay, so let's do an example. A uh, simple three-layer neural network, input layer X, hidden layer H, output layer Y, and we have two weight matrices, W and V. The data parallel way to do this is that we're going to split anything with a batch dimension, meaning the activations X, H, and Y. So all of those tensors are split evenly across processors, and each tensor that does not have a batch dimension, W and V, will be replicated across every processor. So here it's showing what processor zero is doing, what processor one is doing. They're both doing something roughly similar, except they have different halves of the activations. You don't see any communication in the forwards pass, but if you were to see the backwards pass, where you're computing the parameter gradients, you would see some mat moles where the split dimension B gets uh, gets reduced out, and there would be some all reduces in there. So we're going to now, instead of splitting B, let's split the size of the hidden layer, dimension H. So we do that, and now X and Y, the input and output, are fully replicated because they do not have an H dimension, but the hidden layer H is split because it does have an H dimension, and the parameter matrices, W and V, also have an H dimension, so they're split. So again, you have uh, parallel computation on, on the two processors, and you see an all-reduced communication when you're computing Y because we're reducing out the split dimension H. We didn't have to split H. Instead, we could have split D, which is the uh, dimension of, uh, of X and Y. So uh, in that case, you would have a different pattern of which tensors are split and which ones are replicated, and you'd have communication in different places. And if you want to get really fancy, let's split, let's, let's do data parallelism and model parallelism at once. We're going to split dimension B, the batch, across one axis of our two-dimensional supercomputer, and we're going to split the hidden layer H across the other axis of our mesh of processors. So now 
we have different tensors being either split in one dimension and replicated in the other, or, the, or since tensor H has both of those dimensions, it ends up tiled among all the processors, and there are going to be all reduced communications in there, um, but not across all the processors. They'll be partitioned all reduces just across rows or just across columns. So the general case is give all of the tensor dimensions names, and the, we define the layout of the communication as a map from tensor dimensions to mesh dimensions, saying which tensor dimensions get split across which mesh dimensions. For example, in the previous slide, we had the batch tensor dimension split across processor rows and the hidden size dimension split across processor columns. We did this to our transformer machine translation slash language model, and here are the layouts we use for data parallelism, model parallelism, and combined parallelism for that. Uh, for the model parallelism, it works to split the size of the vocabulary, the size of the feed-forward hidden layer, and the number of attention heads. And if you do that, you end up splitting up all of your communication very nicely and, and get a nice model parallel algorithm. And that can also be the, combined with data parallelism by splitting the batch across the other dimension of the supercomputer. Now, picking a good layout is, for now, something that you need a well-trained human to do. Uh, you need to make sure that all of your expensive operations are split. You're not allowed to split the same two dimensions of the same tensor across different dimensions of the mesh. Uh, and depending on what dimensions you chop up, it may re it result in more or less communication. So, example, model, uh, data parallelism, you'd like the batch to be big. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of communication. Similarly, if you're splitting up a hidden layer, you might want that layer to be really big. Um, so how do you use mesh TensorFlow? Well, download our open source repository. You build a graph in Python, much like a regular TensorFlow graph, uh, except that you're using named dimensions. Um, you define what your mesh is and how it maps to your physical processors. Uh, you define your layout of what gets split across what. And then mesh TensorFlow turns your mesh TensorFlow graph into part of a TensorFlow graph. And you still use TensorFlow for anything else you want to use it for, like the data pipelines and everything else. Um, so, so far, we've trained transformer models on, with up to 5 billion parameters on entire TPU pods, getting uh, good performance out of the thing. Um, and uh, these giant models give state-of-the-art quality on, on, uh, on some benchmark tasks, like in language modeling and machine translation, not surprisingly. Uh, bigger models are better. Lots of people are finding that out. Um, and in the future, we would like to try even bigger models. Uh, I think with some uh, well-placed uh, sparsity, we, we would have the computation to train models with a trillion parameters. We've tried up to a couple hundred billion for now, and it runs. Um, so next thing is uh, see if we can get a trillion parameter model to run and give us great quality. And um, this should be useful for other things like low latency inference and situations where you have giant um, uh, inputs that you want to process. And for now, what works? Well, we have, uh, we're emitting SPMD code for, uh, for TPU, including cloud TPU. So this runs nicely on TPU pods. And um, for CPU and GPU, it's still emitting the old fashion device placement code, so it, it runs, but not as scalable. Um, everything is out there on GitHub, and uh, runs with TensorFlow 1, not yet with TensorFlow 2. Uh, we're, uh, and then uh, in the future, we want to uh, use this for different types of models. It would be great to automate the process of choosing a distributed layout, because then you wouldn't need to know about mesh TensorFlow, and it would just figure out how to distribute your computation for you. Um, and we welcome uh, contributions to the open source code, uh, or um, just contact us. And um, I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators, uh, the, the authors of, uh, of our uh, paper. Um, also like to thank the TensorFlow teams and XLA team for uh, for a lot of technical support and help with all of this, implementing what we needed to be implemented, and uh, everything's out there in our open source repository. 
Uh, thank you.